So we are now going to uh, commence with the first panel, which is the ways in which weaponized independence uh, informs our discussions about international relations theory, and for that matter, vice versa, the way in which exit international relations theory might cause us to think differently or to how to uh, put weaponized interdependence into the conceptual toolkit that we already have. Um, you might have noticed from the printed program that this lineup looks slightly different uh, from what we originally had. Uh, unfortunately, Kate McNamara, uh, at the very last minute was unable to attend. Um, uh, and so her presence, of course, will be missed. And if she's watching this on WebEx, okay, <laughs> we're sorry, you know, and, and, you know, we'll hopefully see you next time. Um, but we do have a, a fabulous panel nonetheless. Uh, so we're going to start, uh, I'll introduce everyone and then uh, let them go. We start with uh, Jonathan Kirshner, who's the professor of political science and international studies at Boston College, um, the author of multiple books on uh, financial statecraft. Then we'll have Barry Posen, um, who is the Ford International Relations Professor of Political Science uh, at MIT. Uh, and are you still the director of the Security Studies no, Program? I gave, no? that, I gave up that power. He's been liberated. I from, he's been liberated from. I being got director. tired of being a network. No. <laughs> he's been liberated from being the director of the Security Studies Program at MIT, but was. Um, Stacy Goddard, uh, who is Professor of Government and Foreign. Uh, sorry. Who is Professor of Political Science uh, and Director of the Madeleine Albright Institute of Wellesley College. Um, and then to my immediate left, uh, uh, do you, uh, John, is Jonathan Caverly, who is Associate Professor of uh, Strategy, Security and Operations Research Department, Center for Naval Warfare Studies, Naval War College. Damn, nightmare. that is a yeah. long title. <laughs> um, Jonathan was supposed to uh, chair this panel and has valiantly, uh, at the last minute, uh, agreed to serve a, as a commentator. Um, John will, among other things, I believe, also be talking about essentially what Kate wrote uh, in her memo that was, uh, that was sent to Sorry, us. Sorry, Kate, if you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, the panelists are going to have about uh, 10 minutes to talk. Uh, I will start harumphing loudly if they go uh, significantly past that, and then we will uh, take questions uh, from the audience. So we have a sample harum so that yeah. we know what to look for. I'm going to start with, <coughs> and then I'll be. It'll be more like Muppets. It'll be like that. Okay, I just want to know. John, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to participate in this particular panel, and I want to open up with. Uh, praise for the, the paper and its contributions, which is important because my brief comments will be sort of a friendly pushback and probing the limits, but I don't want them to be understood as some kind of harrowing dissent, but rather an exploration uh, of that. Similarly, uh, my preliminary comments are such that I'm not implicating the authors here, but I do think the topic of interdependence and conflict has not been one of the prouder moments in IR theory. <laughs> Uh, we had simplistic 19th century arguments about a commercial peace, followed by a simplistic hand-waving comments that say, oh yeah, what about World War I? And then from there, <laughs> library shelves grown with endless studies on the matter, which to my mind did not move the ball much further than what Charles Kilberger said in 1954, which was that interdependence was on balance one factor that created a net disincentive to conflict, but by no means stopped conflicts from taking place in a very complex world. Um, and so I think it's um, helpful to have uh, more sophisticated approaches to these questions of interdependence uh, and conflict. Um, in terms of studying interdependence and conflict, as in accord here with our contributors, I think it has been unhelpful to these inquiries, the way in which our discipline has divided into uh, IPE and security studies, uh, an artifact of the Cold War, um, exacerbated by the fact that Waltz's wildly influential theory of international politics was presented as a deductive theory, but was informed largely by looking out the window. And when he looked out the window, he saw, you know, that under the current bipolarity, interdependence was uh, irrelevant. But as Tom Wright makes very clear in a paper we read for, for this workshop, uh, interdependence between China and the U.S. is a very different thing than interdependence between the U.S. Uh, and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, my own modest contributions to these debates, I think, is within the spirit of the contributions of our author, authors, excuse me, in 1999. I boldly, if erroneously, predicted that we would, this, this division between political economy and security studies uh, was a vestige of the Cold War and would soon uh, be unsustainable and therefore vanish. Uh, good argument, dismal prediction. Um, endorse uh, their admonition on 
page 75 of the principal paper for the workshop, which is um, scholars of economic independence and security studies need to come into closer dialogue with one another, generating important new insights uh, for both. And I think that's that remains exactly right. And so I want to uh, give cheers uh, for that. Uh, my second overlap with these excuse me, issues was uh, a project inspired by a conversation with an eminent IR scholar uh, who I hold in enormous respect. And he asked me around the turn of the last century, he said, do I have to really bother with this globalization thing? And I kind of <laughs> followed that up uh, with a product of my own, but I still think that security studies scholars tend to be too dismissive of globalization, which is a distinct but related phenomenon to what we were talking about, uh, instinctively hand waving it away the way they were trained to hand wave away uh, the concept of interdependence. Um, but again, I think that although this is distinct from my own views are in accord with much of the spirit of what our leaders are presenting here, which is that globalization or what what they call weaponized interdependence is, is a distinct phenomenon and lots and lots and lots of interdependence. It is a kind of contextual setting in which international politics is taking place. And so if you want to understand international relations, you have to understand it in the context of that setting. And that's different. I think this came up in your comments between just looking at kind of bilateral <laughs> interdependence between two states. With the balance of my time, however, I thought I'd kind of probe at the frontiers of the argument and explore aspects of the two key illustrative domains with which we are presented in the paper. And again, not so much in super dissent, but to suggest limitations and gesture and relevant questions. So I first want to talk a little bit about networks in general, then maybe a few words about SWIFT, then as time runs short, probably nothing about the internet, and then circle back to some core <laughs> themes. Um, God bless you. So on the question of networks, so I think from a theoretical perspective, networks only matter if they are consequentially sticky, which they may be, uh, but I'm not convinced that they necessarily are. I'm convinced that they're sticky. I'm not yet convinced that they're consequentially sticky. Um, now, of course, as many of you know, I'm an actual card carrying realist, and so I'm not in the business of genuflecting before markets. But nevertheless, I think it's always important in settings like these to be particularly attentive to the extraordinary power, resiliency and responsiveness of markets. I would even reach for the metaphor of water that dammed in one direction tends to flow or spill into another. This, of course, does not diminish the central role of power in international politics, but it calls attention to uh, these limits. And I wonder if regarding network power, this Kohenai distinction between sensitivity and vulnerability might apply, especially in terms of a, as a self-limiting factor on the exercise uh, of network-based power. That is, pulling the strings on network-based power might prove more uh, disruptive and unpleasant in the short run than in the long run, but exercising it in the long run might actually even be self-negating. This is a common problem regarding the exercise of any form of structural power in general. It's great if you have it, but if you have to actually utilize it, then it actually might be undermined simply by being put into practice. Um, the other's note on page 77, I think, is, in, is somewhat sensitive to this concept. As interdependence become weaponized, global supply chains may unravel. I think that this gestures at this possibility, and so I just wanted to call attention to it. And I think it is one of the two hesitations I have about the SWIFT model, uh, which I turn to now. Uh, let me start with a different track saying I agree that SWIFT uh, is a really big deal. Um, because it's a really big deal, I wonder if it's really a kind of typical illustrative example, whether it is a, a special exception to the significance of this form of power and how we categorize it in that way uh, matters. If it is a special case, then we might be think, look, an analogy might be to the 1970s where we had the oil shocks and then everybody went running around talking about how cartel power was going to change the world. Um, uh, Steve Krasner wrote a terrific piece in 1974, pretty early on, saying oil is the exception, meaning that this was an oil cartel, it was consequential, but we were not entering a brave new world where we cartels mattered so much. And even oil power had the whole sensitivity vulnerability aspect to it, as especially over time 
uh, markets responded. And I think it matters here, and this came up in the discussions we were having, because the U.S. was playing the swift card, or is playing the swift card, pretty aggressively and with real effect, but in ways in which encourage uh, others to try and find ways to, to circumvent it. And again, from the paper on page 69, U.S. pressure has led European politicians to begin discussing whether the EU needs to start building its own international financial payment channels. This certainly this was also came up in the comments earlier. This applies to China. Uh, I think it's earlier on that was suggested, but China's cross-border international payment system, um, I think, is another illustration of how there is an emerging both supply side and demand side for alternative networks to develop, and that those are engenders, and it'll be the right English language word, but you get my point, by the practice of network power in, in these areas. Uh, given that I have two and a half minutes left, um, I'm going to skip my discussion of the internet, except to endorse um, passionately the view that this critique of the rhetoric of the internet as a fundamentally uh, as a fundamental space characterized by open exchange uh, serves to conceal crucial power dynamics. Yes, yes, this is it's not just some kind of as Mirchar would say peace, love, and dope. It is it, it, power and power relationships are inescapable even in the internet. And those of you who know me know I'm also quite terrified of the internet, uh, and I think rightly so. I'm going to take 30 seconds just to say I do not believe the great American experiment in democracy contact with the internet. But I want to circle back around to reprise my core argument about the condition that we're talking about, and again give full-throated endorsement to another quote from the paper, uh, which is, there's a common trope in the literature on globalization that suggests that greater economic exchange has fragmented and decentralized power relations. We, in contrast, that's them, uh, argue that these economic interactions generate new structural conditions of power. Um, so while I'm not convinced I'm sold on the structural significance of the command of network choke points for the reasons I articulated in my brief comments, I could not agree more on this general point. And this gets back to the question uh, of IR theory and the globalization uh, product that was inspired by one of our colleagues who I won't <laughs> mention because it would embarrass Barry. Um, but it is a background condition, the context in which um, international politics takes place and it is not politically neutral. The setting empowers some actors and disempowers others. Which for a sports metaphor, but if you're playing baseball or basketball or soccer or water polo, as you switch from one setting to the other, some actors are better at playing that game than others. And so simply by changing the nature of the game you're playing, you're changing the balance of power, capacity, and influence uh, uh, between them. And I think that here, um, the phenomenon that, are, that, that these authors are calling attention to are not about the erosion of power, but about the rearrangement of power, I think is, is a crucial and valuable concept that emerges from this literature, this new literature on weaponized interdependence. Thank you uh, for making sure I did not have to clear my throat that loudly. Um, okay, uh, I believe the floor is now uh, Barry's. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, since even though my name was largely unspoken, I'm often the butt of Jonathan Kirshner's humor. <laughs> I don't mind that. Uh, uh, probably have a few cheap shot points to make over about interdependence, but I probably won't get to them. I, I want to raise a couple of different questions, and I have to confess they're going to sound pedantic, and I think the reason they came to me is that I, we were working on launching the students for writing their graduate papers in a seminar that I teach at the same time I was reading your article. So I think my signals and my synapses got kind of crossed. So I'll make some kind of theoretical and even epistemological points. The question is, is there a variable? Right? And, um, and I'll say, okay, sure. The great powers will, under some circumstances, use most of the leverage they have to get what they want. That's not new. The richest have the greatest number of levers, some of which are economic. That's not new. Technology, those levers will vary from time to time. There do seem to be some newish levers. So after stipulating all the other things, there do seem to be some newish levers. 
have your fingers on. Who are they? I'm not sure they're that new. I think there are examples cited in the paper that tell us these had very powerful analogs in the called first globalization, which historians call the second. It's not cool. I, if, if, read articles about the British cable network and how they used it, and you've got the Panopticon effects. Look at the Suez Canal, which is a choke point, but one that the British use rather sparingly, as far as I can tell. Um, City of London is the same. The history book that you cite, which I confess to not having read about British economic warfare plans for 1914, is about one corner of the British elite saying, let's use all these levers, and another corner saying, let's not. So again, we've seen all this before. Um, uh, and I think maybe it would serve you well to situate your argument in the in the past and basically say it maybe even helps you a bit, tells you something about why these things. Is this phenomenon, this this um, nodal power? Is this best looked at as a dependent variable or as an independent? I think you look at it both ways. And I think that's fine. But I'm thinking that as you think about the future research agenda, you might want to talk about dependent variable aspects of looking at this thing and independent variable. One of the most important things in life are both. Right? Um, but as long as you're asking questions about it, you might you know, you might confront it from from both perspectives. So you have an argument that the, the networks associated with globalization, the interdependent world economy, et cetera, et cetera, there's some prior force that simply has produced these nodes. So in that sense, the nodes are a dependent variable of a series of deep economic It's a story, and it kind of needs to be sustained, and that why you might want to harken back to the historical condition where we saw it. Second, there are states that sit on these nodes and they then weaponize it. The dependent variable there is why does weaponization happen? Assuming the nodes exist, what is it that drives states to weaponize? Since we're seeing more of it now than we saw, say, 10 years ago when, bit of absent mindedness, we kind of created this world. Um, why now is a very interesting question. So, you know, why weaponize and why now? This shifting weaponization is an independent group. What are the consequences of weaponization? Sometimes in the article you hint that weaponization could make the strong stronger. It could be very interesting. Those who want to prolong the unipolar moment will find solace in this argument. And again, also implicated, I think, in your work and some of the other work we looked at, weaponization might actually destroy the international order to help give birth to the networks. Networks that provide the power to those who sit on the certain nodes. Why? Because others are going to balk. Now, realist theory basically has two stories here. Maybe we'll come back to realism. One is, is that um, you know, great powers are kind of idiots, and um, if they have power, they're going to use it. Right? If they discover they have this nodal leverage, they're going to use it. Well, what makes international politics interesting is that we, as Martians viewing Earth international politics, know that those who find themselves on the business end of exploitation of nodes will try and Entering is captured in some of this literature, hedging. Now, in other walks of life, where other kinds of theorists have talked about interdependence or complexity, or say an organization theory, which I used to do, it's basically very common to talk about what organizations do to buffer themselves against interdependency. I use the word buffer. Other people are using the word hedge. Power theorists would say states will so be socialized, they will emulate, they will compete. Right? Who will do most of, who will respond in which ways? Right? Um, we'll know who the great powers are in the world by those who push back and push back with some success. 
China is pushing back by a wall. The EU is pushing back. Interesting, because I haven't decided yet whether I view EU as a potential or not. It's trying to be, but it's, we'll, we'll, you know, those who push back with something substantive will be great powers, and others who are aspiring great powers. We, we will know that this is what they are when they begin to push back. At some point, you will see India doing things that indicate they don't want this level of dependence. This is what a balanced power theory predicts the greatest powers will compete and push back. So if the United States has a momentary hegemonic position to thwart these networks, it will be tempted to use that power. Other great powers they can will compete and emulate. And they will either try and establish their own nodal positions or they will subvert nodal positions. In some way they will stockpile as they this thing they stockpile oil. This is what states will do when they stockpile dollars or gold or whatever they want. The only other point I want to make, and because I think the Haram will be coming soon, uh, and this is a question that um, Jonathan raised, and I think it's kind of it. I mean, for theorists, it's kind of an interesting question, but I've been sort of ruminating on this concept of structure recently, which is used across social sciences. And it's used in kind of a really sloppy way. I was surprised to find out that we get to call things structural whatever we want. Bayes' definition of a structural phenomena seems to be implicitly you know, stuff that doesn't change much, things that don't change much, things that the actors have to respond to and cannot change. So are these nodal properties really structural? I think you're ambivalent about this. I think that's a proper place to be. I think it's very hard to tell whether they're things, whether they are things that don't change much. Realist, I imagine that states who find themselves on the pointy end, the business end, are, are going to try and change it. The second question on structure is a little more metaphysical. It's this kind of concept that Waltz used, which is structure is not merely something that doesn't change much. For it to be a consequential to international politics, it has to be a, a kind of a problem states bump up against a lot. Whether they understand the problem, they understand they understand that they just got smacked by something just bumped into something. Walter's conception of structure, as we all know, is very spare. It's essentially the anarchical condition, which if you don't pay attention to it as a state, you, you will, something bad was probably going to happen to you. That's the simplest. And the second thing is, is that there's the distribution of capabilities, right? Great powers. These are things that you bump up against, right? If you, against a, a great power, and you are not, know it. The question is, is this phenomenon you're talking about have structural qualities in these two senses? One, it isn't going to change much. Two, and I, I think you're hitting at it, but I think it's actually hard to know, is it not only not going to change much, but states are going to bump up against it. It's going to become part of what conditions and socializes states. And I think it's a big question, interesting question. I don't, I'm not going to pre prejudge the answer. Did, did I make it? I was literally about to do it. So Harumph. Yes. Harumph. I was hoping for a genuine Harumph. <laughs> I keep thinking of Blazing Saddles now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I didn't get a Harumph. Uh, Stacy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, thank you for inviting me here. And one thing that, that, that Abe and Henry have already heard is, is how much I really like this paper, not just in terms of what it does on its own, um, but I think what a lot of people have said, what it actually does challenging the field of international relations. Whether or not it's the breakdown between international security and international political economy, which you take on, um, but I think more broadly speaking, cutting into the debates that have been going on between um, liberal institutionalists on the one hand and, and, and critics on the other. So, and again, if, if you haven't read the paper, I think this is really um, a fantastic way to say that the debate between 
whether or not the current international order is something that is governed and has become more collaborative and thus transcends power politics, or whether or not we see power politics all over the place and thus nothing has changed, it's all the same, gay anarchy. They really break that down and say, no, this is very much about power politics within a liberal international order, right? That you can't understand how power politics is practiced without taking seriously these institutional spaces. Um, so it really kind of breaks down those barriers and forces us to think about how it is that power politics is, is, is played in the present day. Um, what I want to do really is focus on, uh, on, on, on my strong point, of course, because, you know, I'm selling Tupperware, but, you know, I'm still the one selling it. So, um, and, and kind of focus on the use of network theory and think about how we can push that out a little bit and, 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 and some of the implications of that for international relations theory more generally. Um, I really like the way you use network theory uh, in this paper, and I would actually say for those of you who haven't read the paper or are interested in network theory, I think this is one of the most intuitive, clear-cut uses of it um, that I've seen in political science, right? Um, it really just kind of comes out and says, this is what it is that these networks can between, uh, between states, is it creates this structure for us and gives us this really nice idea of a particularly powerful structural position in states that actually can hold the, the, these choke points, uh, points, that they're actually hubs, and then they can use these types of different strategies. So it's a really, really nice explanation of network theory and its power in international relations. Um, I, of course, see ways to, to, to push it further, and some of which, by the way, you already highlighted, so I'll be a little redundant, but, you know, such is life. Um, so, so first of all, I, I think that you could don't have to do this, you come from an international political economy background, but I think it would be really useful to the field to think about how we can reconceptualize various forms of relations as structural networks, right? Because obviously you focus on networks in international political economy, but if we take uh, network theorists seriously, that we're looking at a network anytime we see, and I'm kind of paraphrasing Chuck Tilly here, a continuing series of transactions, um, which also contain mutual understandings of what those transactions are. And I'm gonna get back to the last part of that explanation in a moment. And what this means is that international relations have always been filled with networks, whether or not they're the type of economic networks you describe, um, whether or not they're alliance networks, whether or not uh, that there, there are other forms of trade networks in the 19th century, um, whether or not they're the type of networks um, that were set up by various imperial relations. I'm going to come back to that as well. But these can all, all be reconceptualized as networks. What's the point of doing that? Because arguably that's a descriptive exercise and it could be a really tedious one at that. And here again, I think that you could actually then push this out using a bit more network theory um, to, to talk about a broader range of applicability to power politics. So for example, you obviously give us kind of one form structural form of network, and that's really one with hubs and very much a hierarchy, right? But as you noted on the board, you can actually have various different forms of networks, right? Some of which are going to be quote unquote flatter than others, um, some of which actually might have multiple hubs surrounding them. Um, some might have uh, actor, uh, I'll get to this in a moment, that, that, that are kind of the margins of those networks. So I actually think maybe thinking more generally about how networks would, are structured might give you some, um, uh, some, some different idea of how dynamics occur within them. The second thing I'd really love to see the uh, project build on, and I think this is actually pulling off some of the comments that we've heard up here, is thinking about the different types of positions that can happen within these networks. So again, you focus on one specific one, looking at the type of hubs, and then you brought up the idea, are even networks without hubs? And, and the answer is yes, right? You could push it further than that, right? So network theory actually gives a number of different positions um, that it applies to kind of create causal predictions about the type of power that, that actors have. Um, so there are hubs, many times network theorists describe these as brokerage positions, right? Um, so they're the, they're, they're the actors through which all sorts of different networks actually flow. Right. Um, you can have uh, positions known as, for example, prestige positions, right? Um, you might not be a hub, but it's awful nice to be friends with all the other powerful people in the room. That could be a prestige position that can give you some different types of power. But the one I was really thinking about for you, we're not just looking at the types of positions um, that might actually give, be, be up on the hierarchy, right? But the types of positions that might give certain other actors the power of resistance and even reformulation of the network. Right, because that's really, and to be clear, not one article can do anything, 
right? But that's really part of the story that's missing, right? Are actually the ways in which other actors, when faced with these uh, with these strategies, can formulate strategies of resistance, right? Who is capable of working around networks? Right. Um, one thing that's been fascinating me recently is who might be capable of exiting networks altogether and build alternative systems out there from which they can practice their own power politics. Right. I think if you brought in those alternative explanations, you might get a kind of a richer idea of this form of strategic interaction and contestation that's going on um, in your interdependent world. Um, the final thing, um, two, two more things uh, I'll bring up is I do hope that as you develop this, and I saw this, I really heard this coming through today, and, and, and as you were speaking, that you also focus on the content of networks. Abe, I think you were the one that were talking about the limits, uh, uh, the legitimacy limits on using particular forms of power politics, right? And I think a lot of that can be captured by the idea of what's the content, right? What are the symbols? What are the practices? What are the norms that are actually within these networks themselves? And a final thing I think that you can build on that comes um, from network theory, some form, some types of network theory at least, and I think it builds on Barry's point about, he phrased it in terms of independent and dependent variables. I don't know if you two got this as you were going through the process, but one thing that I always hear is, don't you have an endogeneity problem, right? Might it be that the hegemon just built all of these networks so they could actually have these choke points, so they could actually survey everything, right? So what are you telling us with network theory that's different? aren't you just complexifying it, right? And I think there are a lot of different answers to that, some of which are really already implicit in your narrative, right? Sometimes, and most times, actors are building these networks in really kind of myopic ways, right? We're just trying to solve this micro problem over here, and then at time T plus one, it's suddenly, oh, now we have all these resources we hadn't even thought about, right? So I think you have an answer to it, but might be worth drawing it out. Um, the second thing I, I, I just want to focus on in terms of thinking about this from a network perspective comes again from some of the comments that you've already heard, which is the question of whether or not you can generalize these networks beyond the present day. Right. And it's funny because in the paper, I often read a, a, a very much a precedent. Right. This is something new. It's interdependent. Look at all these types of new new techniques and strategies. Right. But even as you were talking, I mean, you obviously re uh, you, you reference Britain, for example, and their ability to use insurance networks to also have this 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 type of strategy. I think you're hinting at the idea that maybe there is a way to generalize this. Right. And I actually think that one of the things that's promising about network theory is its ability to think about structures as something that is are consequential, right, in terms of that there are emergent properties of interaction end up constraining actors in ways that they didn't intend. They're not necessarily immutable in either their form or content, right? And if you start from that idea, right, you can talk about the idea of having asymmetric networks, right, in various different points and the ways in which these change the dynamics of power policy. So you could, for example, talk about Britain's financial networks and the way, for example, in which they very much made imperialism possible by creating these types of relations um, between what we call the quote unquote core and periphery, right? So you can generalize that part, but still talk about, for example, the different types of strategies and substance within those networks, right? So you're not saying it's the exact same thing. Right. You're saying that there might be different forms of strategies and different outcomes, depending on the context. But you're still at the same time saying that some of these networks and some of these mechanisms are themselves generalizable. I think it actually is a tool that allows you to do things that are transhistorical without necessarily trying to flatten all of history to one particular structure. So I think that there's some promise there. In the one minute I have left, I was thinking about, I, I appreciate the fact that, that, that both of you and, and, and Dan brought up the idea of can we actually also make this relevant to policy makers, right? Um, which might be strange for somebody who's think, talking about IR theory to say, but I think it's important. And one thing that stands out that, again, I really liked about your paper is something that I think has been frustrating about the recent return to talking about power politics. And I think anybody here, if anybody picked up the national security strategy, the most recent one, there's a line in there that says, it's a return to power politics, fine. And then it says, which means we must start paying more attention to our military. No. <laughs> um, in some ways, what you guys are also saying is it's time to actually build up the type of government infrastructure, whether or not in the United States or elsewhere, that actually thinks carefully about these tool power policies. 
politics. And arguably, it's not just that there's been a divide with, among ac academics between security and, and economics, it's that there's been a fundamental lack of attention to these type of mechanisms power politics. And as you pointed out, if you continue to do this, if you continue to just, you know, kind of say, this is the new shiny toy and we're going to deploy it, that itself is going to have some nasty unintended consequences. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Um, we will now go to John Cavalier. Great. Um, well, first of all, I have to do the caveat that nothing I'm going to say is a reflection of the policy of the War College, the United States Navy, the United States government. Anyone? Um, uh, Come on, surely. Especially after, especially after you hear what I say. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not the policy today. Um, first, let me just very briefly, um, but hopefully fairly, sum up what Professor McNamara wrote in a memo uh, that I believe she was going to present the gist of to the group. And then I'll make a few uh, follow on points. Um, is Kate's paper, his audience, is like the exact audience of who's in the room, right? When you have John and Dan and Ben and like the people that Kate is writing to are the people who don't worry about economic coercion as a, as a power and security associated with the economy. It's still worth saying because we're streaming out to the world. So maybe, maybe someone is listening in the uh, open, open economy IP group. Um, first of all, she makes the very simple case that markets are structured by power. They always have been. And you can't understand markets without understanding the distribution of power. Okay, again, we all accept that, but it's really, really important to keep that in the back of your head whenever you talk about power or whenever you talk about markets. Um, and then she goes on a very righteous tear, which I totally support, of this idea that, you know, in the 90s and in the aughts, uh, people in IPE ignored power to a certain extent or to a great extent. We looked at Again, open those economies. people in the room accepted. Exactly. Okay. Um, this idea that, you know, focus on institutions, so not as much focusing on the state. All right. Um, and uh, now she points out, well, it's not surprising that we are taking a turn back towards considering power because of two really important political developments. That is, there are different powers in the world that are competing over how the market is structured. And uh, second, which is something that's really important and fascinating to me, we probably won't touch on, is this idea of what does open economies do to domestic politics? And in fact, it's domestic politics have changed. And now they are reflecting back on how the market is structured. Um, so this is just a very nice summary of kind of past work and maybe future work. Made me think, and this will be my first point, is that not only is, not, not only is the market structured by power, but our profession is structured by power, right? We shouldn't be surprised that we were talking about institutions and open economies in the 90s and 2000s any more than, you know, the security people are talking about civil war and terrorism, right? We go where the politics were, and, and probably to the great shame of most of us, we're generally a lagging indicator of what's going on in the world, right? We're about 10, 15 years behind. Um, so which is why when uh, Henry and Abe's uh, paper um, talks about uh, networks and the fact that we use them coercively. Um, if this theory is correct, then uh, they're already going away. And so we, we don't have to worry about them for much longer. Um, What's next? So, what move on, the new, move new on. Thing, man, John? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I have no idea. Last Topper way. <laughs> All right. um, so uh, as Barry said uh, during the q and I think it's helpful to put names on concepts. So I'm just going to ask a real question. How many people like using Microsoft Word? Okay, about <laughs> half, right? And how many people use Microsoft Word? I'll do, right? So obviously there's something going on there, right? Microsoft Word is this classic network good, right? The fact that everyone else uses it is the reason why you use it. You may prefer another software program, right? But you're gonna use it because that is the thing that is most valuable to you. You have agency, you can go someplace else, right? But instead you choose to use what I think is an inferior product compared to the competitors because everyone else uses it. Right. And because that Microsoft charges extra money, right, they're using their market power to charge you more money than you probably are willing to pay or will be found in a perfectly competitive market. Um, so that's that's a network good and that's economic power. That's market power being converted into profit, literally profit for uh, Microsoft. Um, that when I want to point out is that just as Stacy said, there are lots of different networks across space and time. There's actually lots of different sources of market power. Okay, networks may not be that special when we're talking about the politics of networks.
So you think about, we're talking about companies, think about diamonds and De Beers, right? They had a giant warehouse of diamonds and they could flood the market anytime they wanted until a massive technological change happened and the fall of the Soviet Union. And then all of a sudden the market power went away. Um, turning to states and other things that are dug out of the ground, rare earths. The reason why China has market power in the rare earths uh, market is because they're willing to pay the environmental cost of digging this stuff up that we are not, okay? Rare earths are everywhere. They're not that rare, right? It's just a really disgusting process getting them out of the earth and, and bringing them to the market. I look at weapons, right? Uh, I look at the arms trade, uh, interdependence of Vendelet. Um, the F-35, the F-35 is a giant industrial project. The United States is gonna buy, I don't know, 2,500. It's gonna sell another couple thousand abroad to lots of different countries. Any other competing product is, if they're lucky, they'll sell a couple hundred, right? These are massive economies of scale, right? It's not nothing to do with the network, although there is a network effect of the F-35. It's just we're building so many of them that it just becomes so much cheaper to build the next one. The marginal cost of building the next one goes down. And so the United States uses this for lots of different reasons, right? It uses it against Turkey, um, not terribly successfully, but we can talk about that in the Q&A. What I'm pointing out is it's not where the market comes from. Right? It's not where the market power comes from. It's what you do with it. Right? That's, that's really kind of what we should be focusing on. Um, and so the second thing, back to Microsoft Word, think of this in terms of if you're talking about companies, right, you collect rent in the form of a higher price. You literally collect more money, more profit. All right? And this is why emphasizing the private aspect of these networks, I'm not sure is the right thing because, again, it's what you do with it. And it's the unusual thing about these networks and this market power that it's the state that's involved, right? And the state doesn't just want to maximize economic rents, right? It wants to maximize political rents, right? It collects the rents in the form of politics, in the form of concessions, right? You sign on to this project and you have to do the following things. If you sign on to the F-35, you actually have to do a whole bunch of things like giving up your sovereignty, allowing random inspections. It's quite a coercive relationship, right? But these states have agencies, you can drop out. Right. So, yeah, the important thing is you're collecting rent in the form of politics, not just economics. All right. And so, again, I think you're, then you're back to sort of Cohen and I. Right. It's the state. Right? It's the state that really makes this special and how it interacts with market power. Not really anything uh, inherent to the quality of the network. The third um, final point um, is that when we talk about how long this can last, and this is sort of getting back to my, my question about how, how uh, this topic has, um, you'd expect market power, barring some massive technological change, it should be pretty robust, right? You should lower the price, right? The whole point of having a market, market power is the power you have. The reason why you have this market power is you can deter entry, right? You can dump steel, right? These are the kind of things you can do. So we would expect when there are competing products out there that the United States, if it was acting rationally, would do everything it would could to prevent market entry, right? And what would that look like? Well, because the price is, because the rent is collected in terms of politics rather than economics, we should see a moderation of demands, right? We should see a less aggressive use of the network. As soon as there's a, a, a competitor to deter, deter to entry, you should drop your price and that price would be less coercion, right? Now what's interesting, and this gets back to uh, Barry's point, right, we're not seeing that. This is what's really puzzling, and this is why maybe my, my theory is wrong, right? To say that there are competing products out there, maybe not for the dollar, but perhaps for Swift, uh, maybe not for the F-35, but certainly for the F-16. We are, we are in an area of international life where there is a more viable source of giant economies of scale called China for building lots of different products, and that's all within one country than we ever have before. And yet, I think Barry and Aber identifying this idea that actually we're seeing more and more use of this economic coercion tool. Which leads us to what Barry said is actually great powers are kind of idiots. And if they get power, they're going to use it until it goes back to bite them. Um, so in a way, like I tried to talk myself out of uh, this paper is not going to be that important a decade from now. Um, yet, given the attitude of the United States and the fact that you are writing about very visible economic coercion and that it's on the rise, Makes me think that either the United States' market power is growing, and that's why it's charging more rent, or it's actually an idiot, which is what Barry's uh, null hypothesis is. All right. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for uh, getting everything in on time. Um,
before I take questions, I get to perk, uh, you know, I get to chair's power. So I got um, two questions, um, sort of for, for all of you. First is, is in talking about this phenomenon, are we talking about, you know, in, in some ways the the sort of hierarchical power of networks, or is that this is part of a larger problem, which is the emergence of what we would consider winner take all economies? And, you know, really the way, I mean, you know, we borrow, we borrowed from economics, you know, since time immemorial. And one of the principles of economics has always been that, you know, you're generally assuming decreasing returns to scale, you know, relatively speaking, perfect competition that any, any competitor that develops a monopoly, that monopoly will eventually erode over time. And you could argue, and this is in some ways a particularly pushback against John, you know, that maybe what's going on right now is that there are more and more spheres of market activity where in fact there are genuinely, you have network externalities are so powerful, that you wind up with natural monopolies. You wind up with these kinds of winner take all dynamics, um, which is how SWIFT winds up being the sort of dominant standard. How Facebook, despite screwing over its co you know, customers time and again, is not going away. Um, you know, sort of how these kinds of, of, of things endure. And if that's the case, could this, in fact, be a more prevalent phenomenon than, than some of you were sort of suggesting, and in some ways a more unique phenomenon? Because we're now, uh, it, it, what's different from the past is not that this is historically unique. We've had things like this occur before, but in some ways, and again, John, I guess I'm mostly pushing back against you, did the case that we're now operating in an economy where, in fact, these kinds of dynamics occur in more sectors than we previously thought, and therefore that enables the kind of weaponized interdependence they're talking about? potentially be used. Um, and then the, the more general question I have for, for all of you is what strikes me about this phenomenon is the way is the role of timing and the role of intentionality. And in some ways goes to Barry's point of great powers don't seem terribly bright. Um, but there's a way in which this sort of short sightedness is actually useful for them because you can argue that one of the reasons why you wind up with this kind of network independence is in fact that the states didn't necessarily intend to create it in the first place. Very often it's the creation of a private actor, or as I think Stacy said, you know, that, that there's this sort of myopic focus on the utilitarian aspect of the network, and it's only later that people realize, oh, we can do some stuff with this. That's really interesting. Um, although, and then I guess the last thing I'll add related to that is, it is striking to me the degree to which the United States in particular was able to do this on finance, on the internet, and so on and so forth. Whereas with China, what is striking to me in the 5G debate is how the 5G network doesn't exist yet and people are already freaking out. And so I do wonder to some extent, I don't know if this is a function of regime type or if it's a function of something else, but I guess my question is why, why wasn't, or am I missing something? People weren't freaking out about this from the United States, you know, beyond the occasional, you know, French complaint, you know, of hyperpower in the, in the 1990s. Um, but on the other hand, there seems to be much more anticipatory reaction to the possibility of the Chinese doing this. And again, from an IR perspective, I want to know why. Well, so you me out. Um... Oh, I'm sorry, mostly when I was saying John, I was saying Kirshner, oh, I apologize. I wasn't, I was, okay. no, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take a crack. Okay. Um, so I think this is, this is I think the, the point of departure is is correct. I would, sh I'm not sure winner take all is the right metaphor, but I think it's, I think it's massive economies of scope, there are certain spheres in which something is established as it grows. There are just tremendous advantages over other possible uh, entrants uh, to that. And I think that that is um, undeniable. It's why that they are sustained. But I do think in international relations different and say, you know, why the old story about you meet, if you lost New York City and meet someone at the information counter in Grand Central Station is the question of power. And I think that Iran is pretty much as big a country as you can try and use to exploit the system with. And if you try to go bigger, then politics will out. Then people will say, enough of this. Yes, it's terribly efficient, and we, have, we all had tremendous benefits from participating in it, but we're going to actually go 
get our spades and build a different one. Because the political consequences of participating, participating in it become too big because the power is abused. And that's, I think that was what I was trying to hint at with my argument about whether the exploitation of sitting at the center of a network over time will likely to, be, to undermine the benefits of network power, and that might limit the, the, the value of that power. Sure. And what, what you're suggesting, I'm not going to say it's an empirical question, but it feels like it. I was trying to think it is legitimately no, no, an empirical no, no, question. Just, just, just I mean, what determines whether we, what, what, how would we know whether there was some big social force that was creating more winner take all situations? How would we know if these winner take all situations have a longevity that past ones did not have? How would we know? And we could stipulate that as a kind of a theoretical assumption, but I don't really know. I mean, I, you know, it's, and I don't even know how to think about it really. I mean, John was talking about the F-35. There's just one problem with the F-35. It's, it's, it's almost more trouble than it's worth. It's, it's usually expensive. It's extremely hard to make. It's extremely hard to well, but no one else can produce F-35. But the question is, do they have to? I mean, I suggest yourself looking at the Saudi Arabia drone junk exhibition <coughs> after the attack. The US separation plan. Look at the drone junk, and if you know anything about stuff, you know, well, gee, that looks like one of these, and this looks like one of that. And, that looks like a component bought in Czechoslovakia. This looks like something I can buy on the web for $3,000. Now, I'm not usually one of the people who say, well, you know, you just buy a bunch of cheap stuff and you can overcome high tech. But there is an alternative theory that was bandied about this town 20 years ago that everyone about, and now it's gone. And it was this disruptive technology theory, this Clayton Christensen disruptive technology theory. Basically, said so there's lots of walks of life where the challenger starts down market right. with, you know, with cheap stuff, and then by finding success and finding a certain market niche, it generates the leverage to improve its product and, and will display. So you wrote the same thing. Yeah, I wrote disruptive yeah. innovation. Yeah. yeah. So I, look, I, I used to go around spouting this stuff, and it was fun. I don't know if it was right or it was wrong. It was, it was kind of fun argument, but when you when you make a, when you observe the world. It seems like there's a lot of really innovative people out there. That was our intent. I mean, we intended to educate the whole world, and that's why we let them all come down. Like that. Then we're kind of surprised that they turn out to be pretty clever. So my <laughs> pushback would be, do you really want to stake a lot on this idea that there's nat these natural? It could be true, but I, I don't know. It doesn't, somehow it doesn't feel right. Doesn't seem like the spirit of the age. It seems more like the kind of thing that the elite of the hegemon would want to believe. They want to believe yeah. this, to be clear. I'm no, no, I'm not saying you do, but I'm just saying it just seems like, you know, you hear it in lots of play, you go, does this really seem that? Um, just real quick, the, the, in the history of venture capital in Silicon Valley, right, we've identified what, a hundred, a thousand times more massive um, network goods than actually ever existed, right? I mean, this is the thing we are, there's, there's a lot of dry wells out there, yeah, right? Sure. So we see network goods everywhere and there's actually very few. Um, and this gets back to strategic trade theory, like it makes sense to invest in technology that's gonna have these huge economies of scale, but now we're really crappy at identifying, right? Yeah. Um, so in some ways it's not an empirical question um, to get to Barry's point. It's a, it's a theoretical question that we really have to, especially with new things, really have to get right down and say it can't all be networks right there's some political a few political economic qualities that will make it more or less likely to form into an asymmetric network or be a completely flat network or yada 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 um and so i don't i think actually probably one of the things we have to do is start looking at what those qualities might be so if you look at weapons like a kalashnikov right Kalashnikov is basically a commodity, right? You bury it in the ground for 20 years, you pick it up, it's still gonna work, right? You can't get any market power from that, right? It's, you know, it's like sand, right? I mean, lots of people can export sand, it's just heavy, right? Um, something like an F-35, not many people can sell it, lots of, or sell it, 
lots of people apparently still buy it because it hasn't lost a fighter competition yet. And then drones are somewhere in between, right? Drones are actually relatively well, easy to build. Back, there's right? background power in every one. Of absolutely, those absolutely. It's not that's... about the technology. It's about Uncle Sugar as a protector. <laughs> totally agree with that, right? You're paying for something, right? These are packages. Yes. It's a political relationship, exactly right? right? That's a, that's. A, I mean, that's part of the price, right? The yes. price is politics, right? Um, and then nuclear weapons work completely different. So thinking about the economic qualities of an international good are really important. I haven't seen a lot of good work on that to differentiate between. <laughs> um, I want to comment on that, but I'm actually going to take it in a different direction, which stands to your point about the, the, the really interesting story of, on the one hand, we have these networks where the, the effects are unanticipated, and then you brought up the 5, 5G. And yeah. one thing I thought about, and this is spitballing, is this might be another reason to bring in the idea of both form and content, right? So one thing that I think is about your story is that these are ultimately, these are very new instruments, and there's not really a way to see it coming, right? There's not, there's nobody has seen these type of answers before, so it's completely unanticipated. I think one thing about the 5G network is we actually have seen these types of networks before, whether or not it's surveillance, it's security, it's all those. So even though it's something different, we have a story about what these types of networks will do. So the content has already been there, so it tells us something about, well, don't build that form because that will be dangerous. Uh, ready to take questions from the uh, audience. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Anastasia Likachula from Russia. Thank you very much for the discussion. It's really fascinating and very interesting. Questions. The first to Dr. Krishna. Uh, yes, Krishna, yes, you said about the unity question of the like, what's SWIFT a good choice to discover or not? And previously, uh, you talked about legitimacy of the kind of cases when we use different apps. Uh, so, Take on for our course of power. So, uh, as we studied at uh, our University of uh, what we can see is that when the whole story about the access to SWIFT started, and uh, in general, when uh, counter terrorism driving policy, it had a huge support. And for example, when Russia was one of the top supporters of the South King of Financial and that kind of operations. And uh, even with the Iranian case, due to the Security Council resolution that was uh, didn't provide a critical script uh, story, but it was uh, within the logic of this last resolution. The support for this use of hubs uh, to counter some absolute evil in small places was pretty wide. As absolute evil we try to beat, so the more subjective evil we try to beat, this apps, the less sustainable uh, this policy looks. So maybe that can, it's kind of the question of how we can analyze whether the, 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 so that case are legitimate or not to apply it. The second is just I wanted to support Lothman's other comment on uh, how this HAPS competition can be not just the reality of rising competition of great powers, but a great source of power and some maybe not so great powers that can provide some opportunities for not great powers at all. Because uh, what the discussion was faced recently at the conference in Russia, where we had lots of Indians, uh, experts in Turkey, Middle East, that was the very rising demand for, or from ASEAN countries as well, rising demand for some surge power or surge choice when being able not to choose between like. Chinese platforms or uh, American platforms, if it's uh, IT industry, for example. Uh, so some of you had an example about some uh, divorce between parents. So that kind of like early marriage option when you can escape from this toxic relationship with your parents. So I think that's Before you have children. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe uh, that's, I, I think, for like not just Chinese relations, but for broad strategy toolkit that's very promising On your first question, mm -hmm. um, to paraphrase uh, Raymond Aron, um, absolute evil does not grow on trees. <laughs> and that's the problem, which is that those cases in which you're going to have a very broad concession of agreement on a specific target that is doing wrong and therefore must be punished in the context of therefore drawing upon an institution that a large set of parties share, that's going to be very rare. And so where that will lead to conflict is when having practiced that form of power, 
trying to apply it elsewhere will likely take place in a setting there is disagreement over exactly whether there's absolute evil or where it lies, and those that then see themselves as frozen out of or victims of the exercise of this power, I think, will be highly incentivized to seek alternatives. And so, so I guess I'm just making the same point over and over again, which is that the exercise of network power has a self-limiting element to it. For the question, I think you're right that states, even smaller states, attempt to kind of build networks or, or build others in order to try to resist dominant powers. Um, I think what's interesting, though, and I think this goes to the question of consequential network structures, is the way in which, for example, take the United States has been able to use its various network structures to thwart that type of resistance. Um, so I was just at an interesting conference where talking about um, using in many ways positions and hierarchic networks to, 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 to break apart uh, the new economic order resistance, right? So finding ways, you're at the, you know, if you're at the, the kind of center of the hub, you can begin to co-opt certain actors, right? You can buy them off, you can kind of selectively repress others. Right? So again, I think it's important to look at the positions and see that room for resistance, but also understand it's still asymmetrical, right? So there's going to be limited amounts of resources for states to use to resist. You know, it seems to me that one of the points that's somewhat consensual out of this is that you guys are doing a really good job of opening up a dialogue about what's new, right? Whether it's the particular framework you have to develop as you flesh it out or something else. And that's really interesting. I think of some of the work that's going around now about um, Aaron Gray's strategy, incredibly parochial. You know, and Kate McNair uses the term in her memo, the post-world post -world liberal orders motivated myopia. So much of the work on American grant strategy is like Trump's wrong. We were right. You know, the policy world is let's just go back to the way things were. Doesn't at all pick up on what some of the strains and other things were whether in U.S. policy or, or, or liberal order, or whatever. It resists the effort and it also says, well, if, if we're not going to be the leader, there's no other alternative, right? So it's a kind of really stunted debate. I think you're trying to help us not do that in IR, even if people disagree with it. And so there are two aspects of this that I'd kind of add to. People were saying, and maybe some didn't get that much emphasis. Um, some actually came out in, in, in your memo, Stacey, you know, which is looking backwards at, at other systems. I think we also want to look, ask ourselves what is different and what's not about the 21st century international system. So, at least as I see one of those aspects, smaller states have more options than just balancing and bandwagon, right? You know, whether you see this in the Middle East, a country like Egypt that has relations with Russia, has relations with the United States, or Turkey, obviously, or Israel that, you know, as relations with Russia and China. I'm not even talking about the Trump context, I'm just talking about it in a more, more general sense. And, and I think you see this in East Asia, uh, you know, where states are trying to not choose one team or the other. And so the notion of how that affects what great powers can determine going forward, you're dealing with sort of some ways legacy systems. You know, the United States played a role in setting up the internet and SWIFT and everything else. And not only the routing around possibilities, but what happens to these. I think the dynamic that gets opened up about the international system uh, both plays into what you're saying and also maybe adds a bigger dimension to it. The other one is that, um, it's back to the little discussion we before about strong state, weak state of the United States, is the divergence of public sector and private sector interests. Um, you know, so when, when, when Trump goes to China, all of the American CEOs have their own meeting with Xi Jinping, and in the other direction, right? And, and a whole bunch of questions that are being raised, whether it's the repatriation of profits, the financialization of globalization. You know, for American power, you know, SWIFT shows how, oh, this was great. You know, we found a way in which we could align, whether or not it's banks' interest, but it was their fear of the alternative uh, in a particular way. Um, but for American power, this question of, of the extent to which public and private interests diverge, both domestically and internationally, it's a really interesting point to what happens with, with weaponized interdependence, how much a, a major power like the United States can actually harness it for its objectives. And, and, and so I think that, that that's a question that needs to be at, in part as a determinant of what actual power it yields for, for the United States as a major power. Yeah, I think that's um, I wanted to, uh, Rachel Ziemba of NYU, um, I wanted to pick up on, I guess, the anticipatory point, partly to bring it in. I mean, I, I, I think the argument of the, the narrative makes sense, but coming from a policy perspective, 
I think we're now in a, in a point where I think policymakers are trying to grapple with how to get ahead of threats. We've seen this in particular from Congress. Um, you know, and, and then I know we've had discussions about the turn of anticipatory sanctions and pre-announcing this. If this happens, then this. We even see this in the sanctions framework that was um, put out overnight uh, or yesterday around Turkey, um, uh, which, uh, which has some very awkward double negative language to it. <laughs> I hope that will be edited out. <laughs> Many other things will be edited out, but it's uh, if over 90 days these are not removed, these things will happen. And so I wonder if maybe there is a move, having found these tools, that there is a move of, well, let's not just try to uh, get certain behaviors to stop, let's try to stop things before they start. So uh, maybe just something to, to, to think about. Um, and it may change the, the balance of what countries trying to balance against that will, will do. Um, you could look at it, maybe it, so, 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 so that's just a thought. The other one, I, I guess I wanted to push at this question of, you know, Iran is the biggest country one could try to cut off from the system and maybe ask why. Why is that the case? You know, maybe maybe it's an element of think, are we thinking about destruction of some sort? Are we thinking about that the costs of imposing on a country like, say, Russia, for example, are just far too high economically and politically? But us thinking about, uh, What's the scope of these tools? Um, and so, so just just in this context where we do see the U.S. and other, um, especially using these tools on a wide range of things, ranging from corruption against South Africa earlier today, um, that question mark of how big is too big, what's the collateral damage um, may be useful, and get us closer to some of the tipping points of these other networks we're talking about. prompted one thought, whether it's Good. responsive <laughs> to your point or not, um, and it's a, it's a question for you and for others in the room, and that is this nodal power is work better as a surprise. So, point about forecasting, projecting to the Turks, if 90 days from now, you guys have not pulled out of these border zones, following yeah. bad wizard spells will fall <laughs> upon your head. They go, you know, but that wizard spell. So they have 90 yeah. days to work around <laughs> the spell, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And if we or our Congress people start using these things willy nilly, which they surely will. Aren't you kind of in the game away? And if you're using them willy nilly, you're not only giving the game away in the sense of a particular instrument, so describing your type, because I'm the type of country that exploits every lever I have, and I'm not the uh, the make pretend disinterested proprietor of the liberal world order that I be and which helped me sell you this bill of goods in the first place. I'm actually a different country. So what was prompted by your question, I don't know if it's an observation. One other thing, and then I'll go back to questions that were prompted. What that prompted with me was that there are certain kinds of, of asymmetric uh, dependence or weaponized interdependence that in some ways might function only in a one-shot way. So think about China's use of rare earths when Japan, there was the dispute in the Senkakus. They, they imposed a rare earth embargo, although they passed so aggressively denied they were doing so, but they clearly were, and in the end that actually worked. Japan returned the fishing boat captain. In some ways it was a, it was a surprise and that no one was expecting it, and it generated, given the, the nature of the relationship, the relative significant concession, it also generated a tremendous reaction one of realizing, oh dear God, what, you know, look at what could happen. What is striking to me, though, is that there are other areas where, in fact, you know, so that that's an example where I'm not sure it's weaponized interdependence. If it's weaponized interdependence, it's extremely ephemeral. It turns out it's ridiculously easy, or it, it, you know, over time, relatively easy to rework those networks. 
there are other networks for which there's more rigidity or the, 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 the constraint is more significant. And I think on the financial side, you know, that's one where you can argue what the U.S. has been doing. You know, the U.S. has been using these kinds of sanctions for close to 20 years now. Even at the beginning, I mean, I was at Treasury when they started doing this on the energy money laundering side of things. Some volume, but there wasn't a ton of it. And what is striking to me is the degree to which, despite the fact that the U.S. has kept doing this, pushback has been vocal, but actually in terms of effect, not all that great. And so that, in some ways, you know, it suggests that there are areas where, in fact, this kind of weaponized interdependence is more resilient to use and abuse. But why isn't this a part of the general question that was leveled? Like me, is here's the pushback to the balance. I would just toss it back. Why is it that just part of the larger framework of why there was no? And I would say the larger, the, the, the simplest answer is either nobody could, now they can, and they are. Right? And Except they're still see, not with finance. That's the fascinating thing. Well, you're starting you, to see movement, they, but like, right, it's, right. Uh, and of course, yeah, of course, they. Others would prefer to deter us from using the lever coercively. So in the first instance, our friends, the Europeans keep wanting to say to us, oh, yeah. there are other ways we could go. Yes. I, I, At some point, you may drive us to do it. It's not what we want to do. It's what you're driving us to do. So cut it out. Yeah. Right? No, so true. so there's a there's a. And, indeed, and, and one of the things that makes the new Iran case unique is precisely because up until now, whatever you think about whether the U.S. had abused the system, it had always had the EU as a buy-in. And that supporter state had added more legitimacy, so that's a valid argument. I'm going to jump on this point because I think, <clears throat> I think where we're going is very much where Stacey was leading us in her comments, which was about what are the exit options mm -hmm. that actors in the network have in, in these cases, and also that affects the surprise element of whether right. it works or not. So. Like in the recent example with Huawei, is you know it's I think it's an example where we sprung the trap, but we allowed an exit option for Huawei to have that exit option. So we did not pre-caucus with our allies and say, let's create a consortium. We'll all buy Nokia and Ericsson, you know, like, and then we'll spring the trap, and then Huawei will say, damn it, we got trapped. <laughs> But instead, what that we did is that true. we sprung yeah. the trap, then Huawei went to our allies and salami tactic, each one mm -hmm. of us, and now we're going to our allies and saying, well, we'll give you some money for the, you know, yeah. and just the other way around in the semiconductor space right now, the Chinese are saying, there's only three companies that make these things. One's a Japanese, one's a Dutch, and one's an American. And we need one of those in order to become mm -hmm. self-sufficient. And none of those companies, or none of those countries are going to allow us to buy that company. So we're screwed because there's no exit option for us in this network's plane. So I just think about thinking about what are they're going to learn how to make. They're going to learn how to make them is what they're going to do. Well, no, but yeah, in some ways, it can take decades. Yeah, uh, no, this is for, for really sophisticated uh, silicon farms. It uh, and this is the problem that they're in China's confronted with Huawei. Uh, they they, uh, it, they they will build their own independent company, but this is not a you know this is not an easy short term fix. This is a many, many billions of dollars over many years. So Chinese don't have an easy short-term view of history. Sure. And then but the long-term world that. But it does raise the point that there are probably certain, in some ways, to, to use the exit point that, that Stacy said, there are probably some sectors for which an exit option, while costly in the short term, is certainly mm -hmm. viable, and you can immediately track out how it's going to look a decade from now, whereas there are other sectors for which it's a much harder you know, question asked, and indeed there might be instances in which you decide it's worth, there might be a different strategy that you don't use exit, you use voice instead. Um, and so that's something. Uh, uh, all the way in the back. Hi, um, Katja Kleinberg, uh, Binghamton University. I would like to just bring it back a little bit, and this goes partially uh, to Nathan Henry and maybe to the panel as well, uh, to the theoretical contribution. Um, which, you know, you're, you're describing a phenomenon, weaponized interdependence in this piece, and there's a lot theoretically here for places you could go and things to attack. And I was wondering, is going to be the most productive direction to go, right? This goes back a little bit to Barry Posen's point about whether this is an independent variable or a dependent variable and how you want to treat it. So I'm wondering, is this more about states stumbled onto something and now they're using this thing and maybe it's about what determines how they're using this environment in which weaponized interdependence is a possibility 
Or is this more about states actually proactively creating an environment where this is a possibility, where they can weaponize interdependence? And if that's where you're headed, um, is this just Albert Hirschman with new tools? Right? Um, by the way, I, I was, um, but I want to push back a little bit on the, the sort of neoliberal straw man you're setting up here, because sort of the early 90s, end of history, Fukuyama types, you know, capitalism, one, yeah, yeah. Those, I can see those as a straw man, but people have thought about uh, this sort of thing before, and I'm wondering where you see your unique theoretical contribution here. It's, this wasn't entirely clear in the piece, and I would just like to push a little harder and have you answer that. Question. And so I, I would say, I, I don't know, there, there, there are a number of different semi-compatible answers to that. Uh, <laughs> nice so summary. I guess one way I think about it, you know, so we got set up with the Tupperware example. You know, one way, you, you know, one way you could think about it is you could think of Abe and me not as selling Tupperware, but as selling Amway. You know, so the more and as we have this concept weaponized interdependence, all of you people need to use this concept too, <laughs> and then we guarantee you are going to make profits as a result. <laughs> you mean it's a pyramid scheme. Exactly. Yeah, you're asking us to join your. Yeah, but, but, but you're that, on the but, ground floor, Barry. Uh, on. Get on the ground floor and you're set. But, but I actually think is what Bruce said, which I think is right, is you know, I think one of the reasons why we've gotten so much of a resonance with this piece because it, because it, 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 it starts to ask a bunch of questions that haven't been asked. And there are other ways in which these questions can be asked also are going to uh, lead to some, you know, so, so in a sense, this is the start of a debate where hopefully people will start yelling lots of different things, bring lots of different theories to bear on these questions. But we have not, you know, this goes back to what Johnson said, you know, back in 1999, we should have been moving in this direction, bringing security and economics together. We didn't. We are maybe starting to do so now because we are being dragged, kicking and screaming into the real world where economics and security are reinforcing each other in all of these incredibly <coughs> important ways. You know, so I think that the most interesting theoretical uh, direction to take, as Abe just said, is more or less you know, thinking about, okay, so this, it, and this also talks about some of what Barry was saying, we think about this as being structural in some broad sense, but al also if we think about it as being structure based on networks, how do we get more specifically at the circumstances under which networks function. So in a sense, this is getting back to Barry's independent versus dependent variable question. You know, so the independent variable here is network structure. You know, the dependent variable are the consequences. But presumably, there is going to be over the longer term, there's going to be some degree of um, sort of a, a bi-directional causality where people's actions, you know, their, their, their reactions to what is happening are going to have consequences for the network. Under what circumstances will this lead to real change in the network? Will this not? That's what Dan was saying about how there's plausibly going to be a lot of variability across different st uh, sectors and how sticky network structures are going to be and uh, sort of when actors start to think actively about how to, uh, about how to uh, try and push back against them. So I think that's where the theoretical thing is. And the final thing is about the 1990s straw man. I think this, the, you know, and this also gets to the question, so again, Barry's question is, uh, and the question other people face, which is, why is it that states were stu sufficiently stupid uh, came into being? Here, Thomas Friedman has a notorious penchant for coming up with kind of stupid, one-dimensional and um, sort of monocausal mono arguments and explanations of things. I think that Thomas Friedman himself can be the, uh, the subject of a monocausal explanation because I think that Thomas Friedman and people like him created this ideology, which really a lot of people bought into about how the world was becoming flat, how this was the creation of markets, how this was all about you know, the creation of this thing, which was fundamentally removed from the power of state. And I think that had real consequences for the ability of politicians to understand the world that they had uh, that that had been created, and uh, the result was instead of you know, sort of. Uh, people anticipating in advance, in which case none of this stuff would ever happen, we would not have seen this interdependent world be created with so many vulnerabilities. I think you know, so we've seen instead a process of gradual discovery as states, states and other states 
come to stumble into this, figure out what the possibilities are, and we're right in the middle of the uh, a massive acceleration in that discovery. Um, all right, I'm gonna. We only have about seven minutes left, so I'm gonna take all the questions that uh, I see with hands up, and then uh, go back to the peace time. So boom, boom, boom. All right, I'm Chris Lawrence from the Kennedy School. I have a comment that may more from the question as I come out of my mouth. But the, the real force of the paper is not so much to say that networks do this or they don't do this, but rather uh, to, to take our attention away for, when we're thinking about interdependence to point our lens at the physical technologies that embody those forms of interdependence. So if you think of the way you've answered several of their questions, for instance, very question, you know, Will there be these ways out of the choke points? You pointed to the technology, the, the, the transistor, and the fact that it takes you know many years for a country to put itself in a position to build that technology. The answer to the question would be different if we were talking about different technologies. When we were talking about Facebook and and Word, you know, part of what they're selling there is the network, and that's distinctive potentially to certain forms of internet of technology. So a lot of these questions about stickiness or not sticky or not necessarily binary questions, they're kind of continuous answers and you know, pointing to the actual structure of the technologies can um, you know, give us a lot of purchase in how to answer some. Didn't morph into a question, sorry. Uh, ben Dennison, postdoc at CSS, just in the interest of time. Uh, if you could get in a time machine and go back 25 years uh, with this article in hand, what would you recommend to policymakers that they should look to change uh, given uh, the strategies they had back then? Hi, my name is Zoltan Fair. I'm a PhD candidate here at uh, Fletcher. Daughter, you mentioned that um, you know weaponized interdependence on this paper. Um, you know, insight that there is power politics emphasized within the liberal international order, and um, several of you expressed you know views about how you know the uh, you know different um, you know players in these different networks might you know resist push from the node. So if we, we think of uh, the liberal order as a network of networks, the U.S. built, what is China doing um, to, you know, to resist that push? What is China doing to push back? Is it creating another network of networks? Is it trying to replace um, the U.S. as a central node of the network, of the main network, or in the different networks? Why don't we, I'll start with John. It's creating a, a, its own network. Start with John Kirshner at the end, and we'll just go this way in terms of final thoughts, including that question, which was right in Stacey's wheelhouse. Uh, I'm going to go with a final thought uh, instead of a uh, specific response to the questions, although I think it touches on one of them, which is it occurred to me while we're having this conversation, I was curious, and it didn't pick up on this when I was reading the paper or thinking about my comments, the extent, what the consequences for the argument are um, we are now living in the last vestigial moments of an old international thing towards some other arrangement of law? So uh, just briefly on, on, on this question, um, I like the idea of what is China doing and networks of networks, but the one tweak I would put on it. I think the question is what is China doing as opposed to what does it intend? Right. I think the interesting question is right. what that, are that the structural it. outcomes that can come from this, right? So I'm not sure what China intends to do. And as I've said this before, I'm not sure if China knows what China intends to do with these networks, right? I think it sees problems and it is going in and it's building these networks. But over time, the networks that it's constructing through the Belt and Road, through AIIB, and also just trying to build these alternative supply chain networks those are going to have the type of effects. And I think the big question for me is, is it creating room for the types of exit strategies um, that we've been talking about here? We could go back 25 years. I think the Americans would probably try to, from a national point of view, if you assume a state centric look at where we are now and the choices we have, I think we would. Some other, you know, some of the underpinnings is like how the internet was constructed. Example, I kind of agree with 
given what we know now, he made a bunch of blunders. I mean, that logical sense where we have made mistakes. Security is just lousy. We just no one ever thought was it a really good idea. For Traffic no information was choke points to monitor. The anarchy of democratic decision making. You would, given what we know now, I think you'd, you'd really thought about it. I think it was the spirit of the age. believe that we're going into assumption that all good things travel together, all good things forcing any concern about the intellectual future are simply overstated. In a way, was back in Pentagon days, if you objected, the future was not open to you. Exiting. Think us back, so the other is not the same as saying because I know how to design a better internet. I don't. Only design. So on Henry's last point, and I guess Ben sort of going back in time, like how did we get here? There's some kind of ideological reason why we all kind of were blind to entering it. And it's interesting to me that all the flat earthers you were talking about, right? Freeman, Fukuyama, uh, Katya, like they're all Americans, right? It just shows our tremendous American capacity to believe our own bullshit, right? And the fact of the matter is small states have agency in these transactions, right? And there's something we're not really good at at American IR thinking about. Right? These states, and again, I'll go back to what I know, which is weapons, right? These states know what they're getting when they're buying the weapon. They know they're gonna be grabbed by the short and curlies eventually if they, if they cross the sugar. And yet they still do it because compared to what? You, the whole point of monopolistic competition, not mo monopoly, not mo monopolistic competition, just have to be a little better than the alternative, right? And then you could, you could charge that rent, right? And I actually think that most actors who are not Americans and are deluding themselves because they like to think they're nice people when actually they're just really good at power politics almost by accident, is that small states and small actors know what they're getting into because their lives depend on it. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just I just wanted to um, thank everybody for the comments, but also kind of give a like, where did this project come from? How did we get here? Just very quickly was we, we wrote like 40,000 words, which was where do the networks come from? How are they used and how will people react to them? And then we were like, how do we make one article out of this thing? <laughs> and so what you're seeing is like one little slice. But I, what we really appreciate the comments because in our own thinking, those other two slices, which everybody's been picking up on, were the least developed. And so it's where we need to do. With, with two thoughts, one of the things that does strike me, in some ways, to Ben's question, is that the role that it, that ideational structures can play in this, at least in terms of laying fears, or lay, you know, essentially reducing what should otherwise be a natural paranoia in world politics, are going to be exploited by a particular network, and that you know, in that sense, that goes to your point about you know whether Friedman knew this or not, or whether Fukuyama knew this or not, this wanted being reassuring, not just to the United States, but to a wider range of countries, not really un understanding what they were necessarily agreeing to. It's raising an interesting question of when these kinds of ideational structures actually play an important point in terms of permitting these kinds of, of networks to be created. Um, and then I think the, the larger point, we'll talk about this tomorrow as well, is the disruptive innovation uh, argument that Barry and others have put forward, you know, for is one way in which this can be countered. I mean, the, the logic of disruptive innovation says that even if there's a market leader, there is a way in which you can completely undercut that leader through that strategy. But what I'm more interested in is that disruptive innovation as an idea, after it was originally proposed, wound up being applied everywhere. Yeah, that's correct. And misapplied. Apply, yeah, wildly misapplied to a whole variety of things. In fact, it was such so wildly misapplied, it was a chapter in, in my book, The Ideas Industry. And, I think in some ways, one of the useful things I think about this conference is 
one of the dangers of, of ideas in our field is that they can sometimes be asset bubbles, yeah. that they wind up being yeah. applied far too widely. And I think one of the things we're going to need to consider going forward is where does weaponized interdependence work, but also where does it not? Where should it not be? You know, where does it not uh, apply? With that, uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to the audience for being so good and not falling asleep while we were talking. Uh, I believe there are refreshments right outside, and uh, please partake. Thank you very much.